Good morning. If you have your Bible, please open it with me to John chapter 1 in a message I'm calling Jesus and Andrew. And I want to just uh, give a little update on my dad. We appreciate your prayers and your love and notes of encouragement uh, as well. Uh, we had a pretty good week together. You know, obviously he's in some suffering, but uh, been comfortable for the most part, which we praise God for that, and we thank, thank hospice for that. Uh, one thing I, I forgot to tell the 8 o'clock service, but uh, early in the week he did, middle of the night, he got up and he fell. And uh, I mean, he gashed his head uh, open with stitches. They took him to the hospital in the middle of the night to, to get that done. But it's already seems to be healing up, and, and um, he's taking little bites here and there still, and he's drinking pretty well. And so it's all in the Lord's timing of, of when the Lord takes him home. But thank you so much for uh, your prayers. Uh, we've been over there each day, multiple times a day, and uh, it really had some sweet time uh, with Dad. So pray that that continues for us, all right? Now, last week we began a new series of messages called One-on-One -on -One with Jesus. You know, when when we think of Jesus, we often think about Jesus in the multitudes, or Jesus in the, the feeding of the 5,000, or Jesus as he's preaching these messages to the masses. But when you read the Gospels, you're going to discover there's dozens of one-on-one -on -one encounters that are recorded for us. Last week, we looked at how a man that was full of leprosy came to Jesus, and Jesus reached out his hand, and he touched the unclean leper, and he made him clean. Last Sunday, we were fortunate enough to see many people come to faith in Christ. At all three of our services, people trusted Christ. And while I don't know if that will continue to happen every week, I do believe most of these messages in the coming weeks and months, one-on-one -on -one with Jesus, are going to be evangelistic in nature. And that's why very early on in this series, I wanted us to look at Jesus' encounter with a man named Andrew who was the first person who ever brought another person to meet Jesus. Because in the coming weeks and months, I'm hoping and praying, you will all bring someone to church with you to meet Jesus. Now, my dad said that he was so impressed with this ordinary guy named Andrew that he decided to name me after him. So my name, which means manly for any of you that were just wondering... <clears throat> It comes from the Andrew in our passage. I was named after this guy. So let's read together John chapter 1, verse 35. Again, the next day, John, that's John the baptizer, stood with two of his disciples. And looking at Jesus as he walked, he said, Behold, the Lamb of God. The two disciples heard him speak, and they followed Jesus. Then Jesus turned, and seeing them following, he said, What do you see? They said to him, Rabbi, which is to say when translated, teacher, where are you staying? And he said to them, come and see. They came and saw where he was staying and remained with him that day. Now it was about the tenth hour. One of the two who heard John speak and followed him was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. Now we begin our passage with John the Baptist, who I guess we could say was the greatest prophet to ever live. He was the forerunner for Christ the Messiah. He was a man's man. Now, he was eccentric. <laughs> the Bible says that he wore camel's hair and uh, ate honey and wild locusts, but he, he could preach. This man could preach. I would have loved to have sat on the, the hillside to hear him preach. He had a message of repentance. He preached that the Messiah would soon be here and that people needed to turn from their sins so their hearts would be receptive to receive him. Now, he lived out in the deserts of Judea, and that's where he preached the messages, and the, 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 the people came out from the nearby towns and cities to hear him. And on one occasion, he saw Jesus, and he said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And the next day, he saw once again Jesus walking again, and he said, Behold, the Lamb of God. Now, that little phrase might not mean a lot to us, but it meant something to the Jews, and it certainly meant a lot to these two disciples, disciples of John the Baptist, who were with him. Now, we, want, we know one of their names. His name was Andrew. 
Some have speculated that the other disciple was probably John, who's writing the gospel for us. When John the Baptist said, behold the Lamb of God, both their ears perked up. Because the Lamb of God, that was code language for the Messiah. They had been following after John the Baptist, perhaps not knowing if he was the Messiah. But John had just told them, he said, I'm not the Messiah. And then he looks and he says, behold the Lamb of God. And so they knew what that meant. Now, every, every Jew knew the importance of a sacrificial lamb. Every morning and every evening in the temple, a lamb was sacrificed for the propitiation of sins. Now, propitiation, that's a big, fancy, biblical, theological word that simply means the turning way of wrath, to appease God's judgment against sin, to satisfy His judgment. You see, the Old Testament had prophesied that the coming Messiah would be a ruling king, but it also prophesied that he would be a suffering servant, that he, in fact, would be the sacrificial lamb. Later on in John's life, he wrote 1 John, and we read 1 John chapter 2, verse number 2, and he himself, that's Jesus, is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the whole world. So, John the Baptist, he recognized that, and he had a lot of disciples who followed after him, and one of those disciples' names was Andrew. And when Andrew and his friend heard John say that Jesus was the Lamb of God, verse 37 says that they stopped following John, and they started following Jesus. Now, they didn't really know Jesus yet, did they? But they knew of Jesus. They had heard what John had said about Jesus, And it was enough to stir in them, enough curiosity to follow Jesus to find out more about him. And that might just be true in your life. You may not know Jesus yet, personally. But my guess is you know something about Jesus. Someone has told you about him. And the question is, do you have enough faith to seek after him to find out for yourself who he really is? Jesus noticed that they were following after him, and so he asked a question. He said, what do you see? Now, that question in English is difficult for us to grasp really what he's asking, because what he really is saying is, what do you seek in life? What's your purpose? (laughs) Why are you following me? What are you really after? See, Jesus often asked probing questions, didn't he? He was able to move people with just a few words from the superficial to the significant. And this question does that, and I think it's a question for all of us to ponder as well today, because everyone is seeking after something, searching for something in life. And the question is, what are you searching for? What are you seeking? What's your purpose? What are you really after in life? Andrew and his friend, they understood the depth of the question they were being asked, and so they returned a question to Jesus. They said, where are you staying? In other words, that's a pretty deep question. We'd like to talk more about it. Why don't we follow you back to your place and we can talk some more? And Jesus said to him, said, come and see. And they followed Jesus back to his place. And they spent, the Bible says, the entire day with him. And somewhere in the midst of that conversation with Jesus, Andrew became convinced that Jesus was the Messiah. Now, I don't know if it was the words that Jesus spoke or the love in which he spoke them, but Andrew became convinced that Jesus was the man they had all been longing for. Now, what happened next is interesting in verse number 41. It says, and he, that's Andrew, this is after the conversation with Jesus, he first found his own brother Simon, and he said to him, we have found the Messiah, which is translated the Christ in Greek, and he brought him to Jesus. Now, When Jesus looked at him, he said, you are Simon, the son of Jonah. You shall be called Cephas, which is translated a stone or a rock or or Peter, we know. Now, imagine that while Andrew was spending that day with Jesus, the light bulb came on suddenly. I don't know if it was hour one, hour two, uh, hour seven, but at some point, the light bulb of understanding suddenly came on, and he realized, this guy I'm with is the real deal. He is actually the Messiah. And maybe at that same point, he started getting a little bit antsy. In the back of his mind, he's thinking, I I, I got to tell Simon about this. I have got to find my brother and let him know. And so Jesus finishes talking with him, and Andrew goes running to his brother Simon. And when he finds his brother, he says, we have found the Messiah. 
Now, this word found is, is, is eureka in Greek. Andrew says, eureka, gold miners in the California gold rush. They borrowed this word from Andrew. When they found some gold, the treasure, they would, write, they, they would say, eureka, we found it. Andrew runs to Peter and he says, eureka, we have found the Messiah. Now, it's important to know that Andrew did not say, I think we found the Messiah. He, Andrew didn't say, I, I believe I have found the Messiah. No, no, no. He's absolutely sure. He says, we found him. You will never be the effective witness that God wants you to be until you're absolutely sure about who Jesus is. Amen. Andrew says, I'm telling you, brother, we found him. But Andrew didn't just tell his brother about Jesus. What did he do? <laughs> he said, we found him. And then he took his brother and he said, let's go. Let's go meet him. He brought him to Jesus and he introduced him to him. And that's really what I want to zero in on for the rest of the message. Not necessarily Andrew's encounter with Jesus. We're going to talk a little more about that. But really what happens next? The importance for all of us to bring other people to Jesus. You see, Andrew is the first person to ever bring another person to meet Jesus, but he wasn't the last, was he? We're all to be like Andrew, bringing people to Jesus. That, that's how the gospel advances, one person at a time. That's God's plan for the world. One sinner who meets Jesus invites another sinner to meet Jesus. Before we continue on with the message, I just want to challenge you right here and right now to already be in thinking and praying about who God wants you to bring to him, because I promise you, it's someone. Andrew first brought his brother. Now, there's several things I want us to learn from Andrew's encounter with Jesus. Number one, the first step in bringing others to Jesus is to know Jesus yourself. <laughs> Why could Andrew say, Eureka, we found the Messiah? It's because he found him. He met him. He had actually found him. That's a very important step. Let me ask you, have you found Jesus? Have you encountered your Savior, our Savior? Do you know Him personally? Have you ever met Him in such a way that you were aware of your sin as you were standing before Him? And I'm talking spiritually speaking. Where you're aware of your sin and you confess it and you turn from it. And all you want to do is to be rescued by Him. And have you ever been touched by Him, spiritually speaking, where He brought life and forgiveness and eternal life that He gave you? Have you experienced His forgiveness? Have you met Christ? If you have, you'll know it. <laughs> you will know it. Now, for the rest of the message, I'm going to be talking about the importance of bringing others to meet Jesus. But that does you no good until you meet him yourself. Andrew first found Jesus, then he brought his brother to meet Jesus as well. You can't get that out of order. First things first, you've got to meet Christ. If you haven't found him yet, here's what you do. You seek him. The understanding that you do have a Jesus that you've heard about, you follow after him, and you find out for yourself who he really is, and you will find out that he is a wonderful Savior who loves you so. Now, another thing that we learned from Andrew's encounter with Jesus is that the desire to bring others to Christ actually comes from spending time with Christ. When, when Andrew met Jesus, what did he do? He followed him back to his place. He spent the day with him. He spent time with him. Now, can you imagine that conversation of what all Jesus said and the questions that were asked and answered? I'd love to have been a fly on the wall. But here's the point. It was Andrew's time with Jesus that caused this overwhelming urge and compulsion to go tell his brother about it. Sometimes people will hear a message like this on evangelism, which evangelism, we kind of get scared of that word, but it simply means sharing the good news. They, they hear a message like this on evangelism, they re, remain unmotivated to share Jesus with others. Now, they might be motivated a little bit. They feel guilty. They feel guilty about not sharing Christ with others, but that guilt is not enough to make them do anything really about it. The, the truth is, guilt can be a good and appropriate motivator at times. But let me share with you for just a moment the greatest motivator for telling people about Christ. Here it is time with Jesus. 
Time with your, with your Savior in prayer and in, in, in fellowship with Him. When you spend time with Jesus, you're going to want to tell everyone about Him. When you find Christ, when you meet Him, when you experience His love and His grace and His life, you spend quality time with Him. You're going to share with everyone about Him. Now, some people think that evangelism, it's only for the most seasoned Christian. You know, it's, for the, it's reserved for the person with years with Jesus under their belt, but that's simply not true. Some of the most effective witnesses and evangelists are new believers. Andrew was a brand new believer, was he not? He'd only spent one day with Jesus, and yet he was able to bring his brother to meet him, who later would become the Apostle Peter. We had quite a few people get saved throughout our church this past week, and I want to encourage you, if you're one of them, you be sure and bring your family and your friends to Jesus so they can meet him as well. You say, oh, oh pastor, I'm a brand new believer. Uh, I, there's a lot I still don't know, and that's true, but let me ask you, did you meet Jesus? Did you have your sins forgiven by him? If you met him, you can bring others to, to meet him as well. Just tell them what Jesus did for you, how you forgave your sins, and invite them to church. I'll tell them about Jesus. Which brings me to another thing that we learned from Andrew evangelism is as simple as introducing people to Jesus. Isn't that what Andrew did? He brought his brother to Jesus, and he introduced him. I, I really think we overcomplicate it sometimes as Christians. I know we do as Baptists at times. We have all of these evangelism training programs, and I, I'm for those programs. I've gone through a bunch of them in my life. I'm glad that I did so, but here's the deal. It's not complicated. You, you don't have to go through a class to bring someone to Jesus. Now, you need courage, but you don't have to go through a class. The courage is needed because sometimes it's scary. I mean, spiritual warfare, I think, that, that's taking place. We can, we can be a little frightened. It's nerve-wracking. Courage, though, isn't a lack of fear. Courage is a willingness to face and press through the fear with the boldness that God gives us. Now, you may say, Pastor, you just don't understand you don't realize how scared I get. I'm terrified for spiritual conversations to share Jesus, to share my faith. So let me first of all say to you, I realize fear is a real thing. Fear can be paralyzing. Now it's important though as a Christian to recognize that fear never comes from faith. It always comes from a lack of faith. But, but it's real nonetheless, and I recognize that. Now, so, surveys have shown, a number of surveys have shown, that the number one fear in America is the fear of public speaking. Number two is death, which led comedian Jerry Seinfeld to say, if you go to a funeral, most people would rather be the one in the casket than giving the eulogy. <laughs> well, for most Christians, the thought of evangelism, it brings fear. But let me ask you this. How often have you been terrified or scared to introduce one friend that you have to another friend that you have. Is that scary? When you say, hey, Susie, here's my friend Jessica. How hard is that? What if we learned to approach evangelism like Andrew did? And we just went to our friend and our loved one and said, I found him. Maybe you say, Eureka, I found him. I, I found what I was looking for in life. For so long, I didn't know what I was looking for. I was looking for all the th wrong things in all the wrong places, but I found it. In fact, I found him. He found me. I can't wait for you to find him as well. Why don't you come with me, and I'll introduce you to him. We need to learn from the very first evangelist and how he did it, how he didn't overcomplicate it, and he was very effective. You know, every time that we read in our New Testament about Andrew, every time he's bringing someone to Jesus, Every time his name comes up, first he brings his brother to Jesus. Which, by the way, isn't it amazing how God tends to work through families, through relationships? The first four disciples were actually two sets of brothers. When you read the book of Acts, there are a number of occasions where someone would get saved, and then the Bible says he and his household were, saved, were baptized, meaning everyone in the family came to faith in Christ. Last Sunday at our 11 a.m. service, Entire family came forward wanting to accept Christ as their Savior. 
a mom and a dad, four grade school and middle schoolers, three boys and one girl, a blended family, came forward and said, we want to trust Christ as their Savior. Praise God. Amen? Amen. And that's not the first time. That is not the first time I've seen something like that happen. Why? Because the gospel tends to travel through families. The gospel tends to travel through relationships. So the first person that Andrew thought of was family, his brother. But then we read about in John 6, another time, there was a crisis uh, in, in, in our Lord's ministry. There was a large crowd of over, over 5,000 people who were following after Jesus. And they, 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 they were weary, they were tired, they were hungry. And Jesus noticed that. And so Jesus and his, his disciples are discussing how they're going to feed the people. And then all of a sudden, Andrew finds a young boy who has five loaves of bread and two little fish, And what does Andrew do? He brings the boy to Jesus. And Jesus takes the loaves of bread and he takes the fish and he multiplies it. So everyone eats until they're satisfied. In fact, there's 12 baskets of leftovers. There's an abundance. But it started how? Andrew brought the little boy to Jesus. He brought Peter to Jesus. He brought the little boy to Jesus. We also read in John chapter 12, there were some Greeks, some Gentiles, who would come up to Jerusalem to worship Uh, at the feast. And they came to Philip, and they said, we're looking for Jesus. They had heard about him. Philip wasn't exactly sure (laughs) what to do with that, because these were Gentiles. And and so he just was unsure, "What, what, what am I supposed to do here? But he thought, you know what? Andrew will probably know what to do. So he goes and he tells Andrew, and Andrew knew exactly what to do. And Andrew and Philip, they took the matter to Jesus. They brought them to Christ. So when you think about it, Andrew was kind of the first Christian, first one to recognize Jesus the Messiah. He's the first evangelist to tell someone else about Jesus, and now he's the first missionary sharing Jesus with the Gentiles, the nations. You see, Andrew, he knew the power of saying, come and see. Come and see. So much of evangelism and the Great Commission is go and tell. But I think the most effective witnesses, while they they go and tell, they also learn the power of come and see. Come and see for yourself who Jesus is. I'll take you to him. I'll lead you. I'll show you. Come and see. Maybe you're at the point in your Christian life where you're nervous about going and telling. And if that's the case, why don't you just start with the come and see approach? (laughs) Come and see. Maybe you say, you know what? I met Jesus at Valley Baptist Church. Would you come with me sometime? I'll sit with you. Maybe we can grab lunch afterwards. Come. Or or maybe you say, you know what? I met Jesus in this thing called life groups at our church. Come with me. I'll introduce you to some people who introduced me to Jesus. Church Growth Resource recently conducted a survey on why people started attending their church or a church. 2% started attending because of advertisement. 6% started attending because of of an organized visit to them. 6% started attending because they were invited by the pastor. And 86% started attending because they were invited by a friend. That's the power of of a relationship, of love for, for another person. God uses that. So how should we conclude? Start inviting people. Invite them to church. It's not that hard. It's not complicated. And guess what? You're going to be surprised by how many people say, yeah, I'll go with you. And you might be thinking, what? You said yes? Yes, I'll go with you. I'm telling you, you will be surprised by how many people take you up on your invitation. And, And here's the deal. You cannot imagine in the coming weeks and coming months when you are faithful to do that. You kind of imagine what God has in store for the joy in your life when you see your friend meet Jesus in his life or her life transformed by the gospel simply because you're willing to step out of your comfort zone, to have a few little butterflies and say, would you come to church with me? Come and see. I want to introduce you to the person who changed my life. Now, the last thing that we learned from Andrew his encounter with Jesus is that God often uses ordinary people in extraordinary ways. 
Now, I made this point a little over a month ago on a message on Tychicus at the end of our study in Ephesians, but I think it's worth making again with Andrew. Because someone has said that Andrew is the disciple that everyone has heard about, but no one quite remembers. You see, there were two sets of brothers, were there not? Andrew and Peter, James and John, the first four disciples. Three of those four became Christ's closest disciples. They were part of the inner circle, if you will. Peter, James, and John, but not Andrew. He's not listed with those three. Andrew was just a real ordinary guy. He's just an average Joe kind of a guy. He's like us. <laughs> He's like you, you and I. And you know what? Andrew was okay with that. A- Andrew wasn't the one in the spotlight. He may not have had the same gift set as some of the other disciples, but Andrew wasn't phased by any of that. Andrew was content to play the part that God had given him to play. The great conductor, Leonard Bernstein, was asked one time, what's the hardest instrument to master? And he quickly, without hesitation, said, second fiddle. He said, I can find a lot of people that will play first violin, but not many who will play second violin. That was Andrew. For the rest of life, his life, he played second fiddle to his brother Peter. But God used Andrew in extraordinary ways. Can you imagine what it must have been like on the day of Pentecost for Andrew? When his brother Peter, he stands before the crowd of people and he preaches and the Holy Spirit falls on the people. And 3,000 of them are saved in a moment. What joy must have filled his heart. I just imagine that he thanked the Lord right then and there under his breath. Thank you, Lord. Thank you that I got to be a little bit a part of this, that you used me in this kind of way. You see, because if Peter was the spiritual father to those 3,000, Andrew was the spiritual grandfather to the 3,000. Now, for just a moment as we begin to wrap up, if we'll just bring our attention back to when Andrew finds Jesus. He goes back and follows Jesus back, and he spends a day with him. Then he goes back to his brother, and he says, we have found him. Then he takes his brother back to Jesus and introduces him to him. And now, in our minds, I want us to fast forward. About a month and a half-ish later, after Jesus was baptized, and now he spent 40 days out in the wilderness being tempted by Satan. Andrew now has gone back to the north, to Galilee. And he and his brother are on the Sea of Galilee in their fishing boats. They were commercial fishermen. And they're fishing. And Jesus shows back up in Galilee to begin his public ministry. We pick up the story in Matthew chapter 4, verse 18. And Jesus, walking by the Sea of Galilee, saw two brothers, Simon called Peter and Andrew his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. Then he said to them, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. They immediately left their nets and followed him. You see, when you read the Bible, there is a cause and effect in the Christian life that should be very natural. Follow Jesus, become a fisher of souls. Meet Jesus and have your sins forgiven. And then introduce others to meet Jesus so their sins can be forgiven. The old Baptist preacher Vance Havner said, we're supposed to be fishers of men, but in the modern church we become keepers of the aquarium. How much are we focused inward just on ourselves? We are here in many ways, as my dad has said many times, for those that are not here yet. We're to be fishers of men. Andrew was a fisher of men, and he never stopped being a fisher of men. We know from Scripture that it doesn't tell us about the rest of Andrew's life, but there's strong tradition that tells us that Andrew traveled as an apostle to Russia, and that as an old man, he came back to the Middle East, and then he came to the south part of Greece. And there, in southern Greece, he led a woman to the Lord by the name of Maximilla. Now, Maximilla's husband was the Roman procurator of southern Greece, much like Pontius Pilate was there in Judea. And her faith in Jesus angered her husband, who had power and authority. And so her husband ordered that Andrew 
was to sacrifice to pagan gods. And Andrew, obviously, he refused. So he had Andrew beaten and whipped severely. But Andrew continued to refuse. Till eventually, he had him crucified. Not on a traditional cross, but on a cross shaped as an X. It became known as Andrew's cross. Now, they didn't put nails through Andrew's hands and feet like they did Jesus, but instead they tied him to the cross so the suffering would last even longer. And he hung on the cross beside the road for more than two days, and everyone who passed by, he told them about Jesus. Now, I imagine that some people pitied him and, and stared, and, but even with his laugh breaths, he kept uttering the words, I think, here he comes. I found the Messiah. I found him. Do you know him? Let me tell you about Jesus. My prayer is that God would make Valley Baptist Church a loving army of Andrews. An army of very ordinary and ordinary men and ordinary women, of ordinary children and ordinary teenagers who have met Jesus and are willing to say, Eureka, I have found him. Come and see. Now let's bow together in an attitude of prayer, if you will. The message is not over, but I want to ask you to come and meet Jesus today. We're going to have pastors and leaders, here, prayer partners here at the front in just a moment. We're going to ask you to give your life to Christ. It's not hard. Sometimes we, we even overcomplicate the gospel. We, we think, man, I, I got to do something. I got to clean up my life first. No, no, no. You, you, you have the order opposite. You meet Jesus first. He touches you. He cleans you. And then you go on with your life with him. I want to invite you to meet Jesus today, to come to him. Maybe you just know a little bit about him. Maybe you don't have all the ans- your, an- your questions answered yet. But would you step out with the faith that you have? And would you seek him a little bit more to find out for yourself who he really is? I want to invite you even from the balcony, wherever you're at, in just a moment we're going to sing. And and you just step out and come as we do so. You take one of these leaders by the hand. You you let them know that you want to meet Jesus. that, That you want to make Jesus your Savior and your Lord. But it could be that that you've known Jesus, and you've actually even experienced His touch in your life. But for whatever reason, maybe as the years or your decades have gone by, you've grown a little bit cold and apathetic to His mission. You've become selfish. Enjoying Jesus yourself, but not sharing him with others. My intention is not for our church family to be, feel so guilty that we get paralyzed by that guilt, but to be motivated by Andrew that it's not that hard. That we just need to spend some more time with Jesus and allow him to do a great work in us that will that will propel us to be excited and passionate about inviting others to Him. It could be that God places a name, a person, whom He loves on your mind and heart right now. Maybe it's, maybe it's more than one. We had an emphasis a number of years ago called, Who's Your One? Let's narrow in on something. Just do Bring someone to Jesus. Maybe he's placing one, two, three more on your mind and heart. My question is, are you willing to invite them to meet Jesus? Are you willing to invite them to church? Maybe during this invitation time, it's really a time of decision for us as a church. Maybe you need to make a decision before the Lord right where you're at. 
to say, yes, God, I will invite people. I will invite people. However he leads, let's respond to him. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your love. We thank you for your touch. We thank you, Lord. I thank you that I can say I have found the Messiah. Lord, thank you for finding me. We love you because you first loved us. Thank you for pursuing us. And I ask, Lord, that you pursue people right now with your spirit, that you would touch their blind eyes and their hardened hearts, and you would open them and soften their hearts. And, Lord, that as they seek you, they would find you. Lord, meet us here in our place of need. I ask, Lord, that you do a great work in us. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.